Hey, I am at the Greater New York Dental Meeting. I just finished my lecture, and I saw Mark Hollis, who's the CEO and co-founder of Mac Practice. And I um, I snagged him for an interview. I said, I want to podcast you because I always thought it was very strange. Um, this is why I start off that. Um, I'm 53. My four boys, Eric, Greg, Ryan, and Zach, are uh, 26, 24, 22, 20. Whenever you go on a ski slope... You always know who's old because we're on two skis and the kids are always <laughs> snowboarding. You never see a young kid on two skis right. and they're all on Mac and we're all on um, Dell or Microsoft. And every time I go lecture, when the AV guy set me up, I say, uh, so, uh, you know, what percent are uh, uh, Mac and, or Macintosh or Dell? I mean, I'm kind of an old fart being on a Dell. He says, well, he says, if you're your age, that's what he says. You know, that's a nice way. He says, well, if you're, you know, your age, they're all on Dell. But if they're young kids, they're all on Mac. And so when I go into dental offices, when I go into dental schools, they're all on Macintosh. Right. They're all on iPhones. A hundred percent of them are. I don't see anybody on a Dell. And then when they go to work for an old man in a practice, he's always going to be on uh, Dentrix, EagleSoft, Softan, and it's all going to be on a Dell. And then you see these young kids coming in, and they bring in their their Macintosh. And so I saw you, and you're. Um, I went to Creighton, and oh, really? um, in that. Omaha, Nebraska, oh, yeah. and uh, I know Dental Mac started in Lincoln. Yes, it's and in Lincoln. The, yeah, and the who, company's who, in Lincoln. And your partner started it originally in Lincoln. My, my partner was my partner <laughs> started. Started developing Dental Mac. He was his brother-in-law was a dentist, and he was in a basement with two other people at the time. Computers cost tens, you know, a ten thousand dollar computer. That's that's how much it cost. So they had two computers. They worked twenty four hours a day, three programmers, in shifts, so that they could sleep eight hours. Each one would take off eight hours, so they could work twenty four hours a day, and they developed Dental Mac which was the first software for dentistry that had uh, in a graphical user environment. This is prior to the introduction by Microsoft of Windows. When IBM wow. was still working on and under the mistaken impression that Microsoft was going to actually work with IBM to have a graphical user uh, applic uh, operating system. And so he developed this application, sold it to a company called Healthcare Communications. And Healthcare right. Communications is Lincoln. And he was the director of development, owned some stock in the company at the time, but not controlling the company, controlling the uh, operation of the company. And uh, they had about 6,500 offices. Now, this is at a time we're talking about before the big commercial, you know, the famous commercial, <laughs> the 1984 commercial by Apple. Right. And um, and so at that time, they had 6,500 practices, although Probably, I would say less than 50% of dentists were even automated on in, in character-based solutions in DOS or Unix. So it was, it was a pretty big deal. The problem is that the company was mismanaged, uh, but it was the leader. And, and then Dentrix actually started. I, I don't know. When, I, I remember when Dentrix started, and they had almost new users, and nobody knew if anything it was would even Provo. come of them. It was in Provo, it Utah, was, where right. Gordon Christian was. And right. They, and that was, they, they started, they launched it when uh, uh, Windows started. I That's think, correct. Were they on Windows 3.0 version? Uh, 3.1, I think, was, 3 their, was their, first, their first release. Yeah. And they had about 300 users. After, it took them about three or four years. And the real burst was when they were purchased, obviously, by Shine. That was, that was when they really exploded because they had access through the But dealer. I have to tell you, the, the reality is, um, is if you go to Dentaltown mm -hmm. and you pull up Practice Manager Software, all the threads on Dentrix that's owned by Shine um, – um, what is it? Um, Patterson owns uh, EagleSoft. Yes, right. Um, Kodak owned um, um, Practice Works. Practice right. Works, which is now CareStream, which is CareStream, which right. is SoftDent, which uh -huh. is what I have. Um, they don't seem to really have any happy customers. Um, it seems to be just big griping, moaning, complaining stories. <laughs> and um, and then um, Open Dental. Um, out of Oregon, right? It's got a lot of raving fans. Yeah, and I've always thought, I, I always thought, whenever I see anything with your company, I just thought, man, you you have an easy play because the future, all the dentists, they're they're big Mac fans. They already love your Mac, right? And I don't see anybody really. I mean, I, I don't see anybody ever saying, ah, that Dentrix, that the, you should get Dentrix or EagleSoft <laughs> or Soft that. That's a good idea. Yeah. It just seems to be all complaining. So so what so what is the future uh, of your um, of Macintosh? With running a dental office day, what's the state of it today? Well, here's what's exciting. I think there was a benchmark that occurred at the ADA just a couple of weeks ago. And, and uh, basically, in order for a dentist to be able to purchase software for the last 
uh, since we've been in business and for a, a number of years before that, is necessary to know that you could have digital radiography that would work in your practice, that you had not only one choice, but that you had a variety of choices at a variety of price points. So the guy that wants, the guy that sees that the low-end solution that's inexpensive is of a diagnostic quality and sufficient for him, he's got an, uh, that choice. If he wants the highest-end system, he's got that choice. And that was not available in a Macintosh when we started 12 years ago. Uh, and the reason it wasn't available is because there wasn't a market for the manufacturers to sell. And there wasn't a guy that was willing to walk around and go to their booths every single trade show and say, well, it's time to develop your, you know, develop your equipment and create native drivers. And we can work with you to make that work and give you access to a marketplace where you can actually sell it. So over 12 years, that's what I've done. So I've got a book. I didn't bring it with you. Actually, I meant to do that. But there's a list that we give, a guide to the show. Uh, for people that are interested in having dentists who are interested in having a Mac solution or already have Mac practice. And it's a guide of all of the solutions that work natively, some of and some PC uh, versions that work that we've cooperated with the manufacturer to create a bridge so that they can use that on their on their Mac and use it with Mac practice. And it's integrated. And that the the what happened two weeks ago is that um, is that the I think what's a, a revolution is the new product. I don't know if you've seen it. Have you seen the new, very small product, uh, the Pispix uh, Foster Plate solution that came out from Acteon? No. Okay, so whether you're Foster Plate or not, uh, almost all of Europe is Foster Plate. That's, that's what they use, Lion And shirt. that's where you, you're, you're shooting a film x-ray, then you're scanning it into a digital solution. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a film. It, it's a digital film. And so you can use that same film... Uh, 500 to 1,000 times easily, depending upon how you treat and why, it. And why do you think Europe likes that solution more than a digital x-ray sensor? Well, I'm not a dentist. So in a sense, I'd rather reserve, an, my, you know, my opinion might not matter as to why I think that is. But I, I'll tell you some of the benefits of those people that look at both and tell me why would I choose this versus choosing that. So one thing is if you drop a piece of film, you can pick it up and probably reuse it. But if you stepped on it and, and really damaged it, you lost $40. That's one reason. Another reason is because you can use a size 0, size 1, size 2, size 3, and you can put three size 3s in and, use an, and do an occlusal into, into a sleeve, and you can have them sitting right next to your, right next to your uh, device. There's no wires. There's incredible comfort because of the fact that it's not rigid like the sensor. So uh, I, I think one, one of the things, you're probably aware of this, the first real sensor solution that was available uh, it, uh, in the world really was trophy and it was available in France and it was, uh, the government actually subsidized it, which is a weird thing. Why our government does not subsidize using digital radiography when it has a benefit to consumers. It has a benefit even to the public in regard to reducing the cost of, the, you know, the reason we don't subsidize is because Ronald Reagan believed in free trade. Okay. And then when the manufacturers come up to him and said, well, Japan's subsidizing TV manufacturers. I can't sell TVs uh -huh. against a Japanese company that's getting subsidized. And Ray Reagan didn't care. He just kept saying free trade, free trade. And the Koreans, the Japanese, the Chinese, the Taiwanese, the governments all invested with their industry. And that's why. And since Ronald Reagan, we've lost 50 million manufacturing jobs. Wow. And you still hear Republicans saying free trade, free <laughs> trade. So that, that's the answer. But, you know. Yeah. We're not supposed to talk about sex, religion, politics, or violence. But, well, th uh, thanks for the information. But yeah, re re the Republicans, every time they say free trade, we'll lose 10 million more jobs. So bef so the Europeans in Europe, they've had a lo the longest experience with digital radiography, and they have all gone from sensor to phosphor plate. So it's an, if you look at that ev evolution, you'll well, see that they've done So, that. So the, the sensor is, is high cost. I mean, how much is a yeah. sensor? A sensor can digital. run between, on the very low end, four to $5,000. And how much is the insurance? But they go, can go as much as $16,000. Yeah, and how much is the insurance and, a year? And some companies will charge as much as $1,600 per sensor per year. For insurance. For insurance, so, it, so and th that's only good. That doesn't mean necessarily it might, may or may not, depending upon the contract, but it not necessarily mean that you're going to get a free sensor when you drop a sensor. So would you? So basically, the phosphor 
the answer to the phosphor flate is it's lower cost. It's it's lower cost. It's it's easier for the patient to tolerate. Every patient tolerates it. It means that instead of having to go find a zero sensor because your patient's mouth will not yeah. accommodate a one or a two, you and got I, that right I've, there. And I've always said that if you send a uh, hundred dentists to a dental convention for three days, they will spend all three days trying to figure out how they can go into debt and raise their overhead. I, I know. Well, and that that's just what they do. Right. So if you ever go to a dentist say, hey, I got this really neat idea <laughs> how you can lower your overhead and do everything more simple. And they're like, nah, I don't know. Right. But if you say, man, I got a $10,000 machine that if you put 2000 down and financed it for five years, that every time you do an impression, it'll cost $10 more. They'll go, wow, <laughs> that sounds very interesting. And uh, so that's. I'd like how, to meet some more of those dentists. But anyway. that's just how they roll. They yeah. just love to increase their overhead. They yeah. love to make a mountain out of every molehill. Th this is a great solution, also as an additional device. What I wanted to tell you that that has that is an indication that Apple has or the Mac product and Mac practice has arrived is that this product came, was introduced two weeks ago simultaneously Mac native and Windows native. And so after 12 years of convincing manufacturers who had a solution that had a Windows driver to, it was SUNY, we developed the driver, and then we did that because they were willing to work with us. Then every, other companies wanted to now be on the platform and have access to our clients. Uh, and and so, how many clients do you have? Uh, we have we have about 30,000 users and 4,000 practices, but they're not all dental because we're also the leading developer of medical chiropractic and eye care on the Mac. So about 1,500. Medical, chiropractic, yes. and? And eye care. And eye care on the Mac. On the Mac. So and how many how many dental about offices? About 15, 1,500 uh, practices, dental practices in the United States. So we're about all, 30 countries. But right. 1,500 in the United States? Yes. In 30 countries. Right. Is, are you the leading Mac player? Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Yeah. So we'd have, uh, and, and how much does it cost to use the Mac software? How much is it to if, if a dental student wants to start their office on Mac? So uh, the prices range between maybe six and fifteen thousand, depending upon what options. I, I have. Um, I don't believe in bundling. I don't believe in selling somebody something that they don't want because it's like a lower price if they buy it today. I don't want to be the guy at the trade show that sold them something and then they find out they didn't need it, didn't use it, but they paid more money. Isn't that great? I would rather sell them a, a product at a fair price. I'd rather sell them it's the same price that they'll pay a year and a half when they realize that they now want it. So I'm not giving them some incentive trying to sell them something they don't want. I've been in the business for 30 years, and I've sold it both ways, and I just don't like bundling. So basically, that's why there's such a range of pricing, because it really depends on what the client wants. Well, what, what do you think of the business model where some software companies say, I don't want to sell uh, it like a car, because then I am always have to be selling more and more cars. I'd rather get all my clients to give me a little money each month, right. so it's better for budgeting and forecasting and programming. Um, some software companies have done that over the years. Well, um, obviously, that's the way cloud vendors do it. They, you know, they pay a, a fee. The, the problem with that is that, once again, you've got clients. Typically, when they do that, they also sell a bundle. They generally do not sell like with certain options, and this is your price. You don't have much of a wide variety of what you pay. Uh, but that's lease, you know, I mean, leasing has been available in the United States for I don't know how many years, how many times, how many years I've been selling tax qualified leases. The benefit is if the client buys, if they want to make payments, that's great. So you buy the software, you buy your hardware, you buy your training, and you buy it in the month of December. And let's say that everything, everything costs 20 to $25. You get a section 70, 179 tax deduction right now. You don't want to pay for it right now? Great. It's no problem. Get everything that you want. Get a section 179 tax deduction and then pay four to $500 a month for five years. But at the end of it, all you're paying is the annual support fee. So you get the tax deduction. You get to make your payments like you just said right now. But the payments don't go forever. The payments aren't the same forever. You're going to pay for support because you want to have it current. You want to have them on the most recent operating system. You want all the new features and upgrades. But you don't want to have to pay for the software over and over again. I've done comparisons with products like cloud vendors that sell their solutions like that. In a single doctor practice, it takes about six or seven years before it equals if you actually bought the software and paid for the annual support. It's pretty equal. And then after that, it's astronomically higher for, uh, for a cloud solution. If you take two doctors... In about three years, somewhere around three years, 
in the third year, automatically it's it's astronomically higher. So now at the end of five or six years, they're paying they paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for something that they could have paid over the same five or six years, maybe forty thousand dollars for. I want to ask you another thing. Every every consultant that I've known for twenty twenty five years says when they go into an office and they look at the user-generated reports of what software functions are being used, mm-hmm. that in every office in America, 80 to 85% of all the software has never been used ever. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? Well, um, I, I think that dentists, many dentists, do not understand the value of training. They, don't, they have a tool that's incredibly powerful. They looked at it when they bought the solution. They bought it based upon it doing certain functionality, but they may or may not actually implement the functionality. I think that, you know, as human beings, all of us are resistant to change. And so the dentist is resistant to change, but also the front desk is resistant to change. And very frequently, the dentist does not act as a good leader in terms of moving past that resistance. The software, the, the software has to do a lot of things that it can't, um, that somebody may not use, that a particular dentist may not use because of the fact that it has to be versatile. And I think that dentists think that they all run their practice very similarly. But if we took an analysis of dentists and how they run their practice and we compared it, we would find that there was maybe, I think that we'd find that there was an intersection of about 40 to 60%, but we'd find that there's a very large percentage where they vary greatly from one to the other. And the only reason, to, the only way to really do that successfully is to be able to have that choice. So you call up and say, I want to do this with my software, but I never thought about it when I bought it. Can I do that? Well, yeah, I can do that because you know what? We've had a hundred other dentists that wanted to do that. You didn't want to do it when you bought it, but you can do it now and you don't have to change softwares to do it. All you really need is maybe a little bit of consulting and a little bit of training, which is a lot less expensive than replacing your software. And the only other option for that is to have every, is to have a million different versions of the software program that only had what the customer what that customer is going to use. However, by selling my software a la carte, for example, if you Howard, if you were to buy our software right now and you said, "Look, I I need to replace what I'm doing with Softdent. I got to do billing. I got to do scheduling." I'm going to do charting. I've got to do digital radiography. Does your product work with my sensors? And so we replace your software. But you also look and you say, well, but one of the reasons that I'm looking at going to my practice is because I also am not really, I'm not having my patients help me enter their data into my system. And so I want to do that. I want to hand them an iPad and I want them to enter their data into my system so that I stop paying my staff to enter the data into the system. And so I'll pay you $200 a year. I'm willing to do that, but I'm not going to do it today. I'm going to pay you $200 a year when we get to it. And then I'm going to put an iPad and I'm going to put my employ- my patients to work and they're going to love it because they can take their own folder. They can sign their HIPAA release forms. They don't have to retype, re handwrite information that they already gave me when they gave my staff their appointment, when they made the appointment. So everything's there. They can put all their clinical history. They can review it, tap a button, and then it goes directly into my practice. And I didn't have to pay my staff to do that. You say you want to do that. That's great. But you might not do it day one. You might do it a year from now. You might do it the next year. But when you're ready, your software is flexible to be able to add that. And the other thing is I didn't pay. I didn't charge you for it until you told me you were ready for it. So by having the flexibility of having it a la carte and having these different options that you can choose to do, do you know about secure messaging? Do you, are you familiar with secure messaging? You mean for HIPAA? What, th- well, secure messaging that will qualify for HIPAA or, right. or would prevent you from not qualifying for HIPAA and, getting, and prevent you getting, from getting a $50,000 per email fine. So we have secure messaging built in, but we don't make you have it. So we get, it's an option. You want it? It's $10 a month in order to be able to have a secure email address, and then $10 a month for whatever person, if they don't already have it, that you're going to communicate with, whether it's, uh, if it's another dentist. Um, you might not appreciate the fact that you want to have your patient uh, use a, a, a certified electronic health record portal, a patient portal, but you might appreciate it later. So then you can pay for it when you want it. When you appreciate it, you can come to us and say, you know, I heard about this really great thing. Can I do that with my software? And we say, oh, yeah, we could. Here's what it does. We can turn it on for you, but we haven't been charging it for you until you are ready for it. And then we're going to make a suggestion. We're going to say, you know, if you really want to be effective with this, Howard, the best way to do this is not just to have us turn it on. 
the best way for you to do it is either have your regional representative pay them to come in for a couple of hours or half a day and do training and help you learn your software better or train our cor- call our corporate trainers will charge you out on an hourly fee by the minute and help you learn how to actually use it and help you change the behavior in your office to be more effective. That's, I think that's the key is having training available, having really capable software, being able to choose when you want to implement it and not being charged for it, whether or not you're using. I think the key thing you're saying is they have the software, they're not using it, but they're paying for it. My goal is to have these additional abilities. I, you know, I was thinking about it this morning and it, it's hard. It, some, you know, it's doctors don't necessarily believe it, but the bottom line is the more money that they are paying Mac practice, the more money they are saving. There's not one thing that we put into Mac practice that isn't either required, but like, uh, like secure messaging, but it prevents them from getting a $50,000 fine. So what's $10 a month to prevent you from getting a $50,000 fine, but everything else we do basically saves them money. Clipboard, $200 a year, but your what's it worth to have your patients enter their own data into your system? No scanning, no copying. Uh, all the clinical records go directly in. Everything's available electronically. Who entered it? Who'd you pay to enter it? The patient entered it. You didn't pay anybody to enter it. The pay, and the patient loved it. So it basically, the, what, what I do, and this is my, I've been doing practice management consulting for about maybe 20 years before I got involved in, in, uh, well, in my practice. What kind of practice management consulting? Uh, I, worked, I started with, with a buddy of mine here in New York. I had a hard time. He was on 30 Central Park South, and he was having a hard time uh, buying his uh, – buying his practice because his building was going co-op. And, uh, and we basically, I had a lot of business experience and a lot of small businesses, and I won't bore you with all the long <laughs> string of things I did, but I said, look, Bob, why don't you just let me come in. Let me see if I can understand what's happening in your practice. Let me see if I can understand dentistry, and, I can, and let me work through some things for you, and let me, let me see if we can, you know, if I can help you. So we started looking at things, and this is before, actually how I found Dental Mac and how I started, decided, decided between a Mac and a PC. I decided he would never be able to learn how to use a PC. So if he gave his front desk person the PC, he'd have the same problem he had right then. Only his front desk person knew what was happening to him. So his front desk person wanted a raise, he had no choice. I said, if I give him a PC, it's going to be exactly the same thing. He's still going to have no choice. I said, at least with a Mac, maybe he'd be able to sit down and run some reports and be able to understand what his receivables are without having to ask his front desk person to do that. So in any event, I started, I started working with him to do that. That's how I got involved in the business. And I, did, I then saw an opportunity instead of just working with him, he became kind of passive aggressive. You know, people, they, want, they start calling you for everything. You know, well, what light bulb should I get? I forgot what you told me. I would do the research for him. I decided that the software was a way of being able to make a big difference in many practices, a big positive change in many practices, and then be able to step away. And when the client was ready, they might call me for consulting or additional training. And then I would come in and I would make another big difference. And I've never, ever sold my services, nor do my, does my company ever sell the product or service that does not generate many, many times greater than whatever we charge. So what you were saying about, you know, buying something that generates less, you know, or creates, you know, increases your, re- increases your cost, but doesn't increase your revenue. I, I totally agree with that. And the solution that we provide, when I think of a new feature, I think of something that could, that could help a dentist be more effective. I've got to figure out a way to pay for it. It costs money. You've got to have somebody develop it. I've got to pay engineers. You've got to have somebody support it. You've got to stay with it. Even if I only have 10 people that buy it, those people expect me to continue to support it no matter how many people bought it. And I'm not going to force everybody to pay for it just because I, I think it'll be useful and only 10 people want it. So I've got to figure out that cost. But the bottom line is that cost is never greater. It's only a small fraction of how it benefits the customer and how it benefits their patients. And that's, that's how I develop. That's how we develop the entire software program is basically making an investment that saves money, uh, increases productivity, uh, reduces the amount of time involved, Im- improves communication, it imp- and improves the the lifestyle of the doctor. I know you were talking earlier about about dentists. Um, you know, a lot of dentists who are meant. You know, that there's so much stress on them, uh, and they have trouble dealing with it. So the key thing is they want to treat patients. They want to get this other stuff out of the way, and the goal is to basically take care of everything else so that that can step out of the way and they can treat the patients. So who's that's my goal for them. So your 1500 users, are they usually new users right out of school and like Macintosh? Or are they a lot of them older guys 
who are switching from uh, something else and going into Mac. So, so the interesting thing is I told you I've been doing it for 30 years. And at one time, I had 650 offices myself that I did. Um, I supported on uh, Dental Mac, MediMac, and ChiroMac. Uh, and I, that was in the New York metropolitan area. I installed them, I trained them, and then I provided ongoing support as needed for them. Because we're on a Mac, there wasn't a lot of ongoing support in terms of hardware, but they would hire me for consulting and they would hire me for training. And that was kind of, that was kind of my practice management consulting with 650 clients. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty sizable practice. And that then when we, when um, uh, basically what happened is the Kodak bought Dental Mac and, uh, and uh, uh, WebMD bought MediMac and ChiroMac. And all of them decided that there was a couple of things. One, one thing is they didn't understand Mac users. They said, well, obviously, the only reason these people are on Macs is because they don't know that there's a great Windows product. I tried to tell them, I don't think you understand. You know, I do know that some of them started before there was a Windows product, but they know there's an alternative on Windows, and they appreciate a Mac. Clearly, you don't know the difference, and therefore, you don't understand why they're on a Mac. But they basically chased them away. So in Kodak, I saw that something like 85 to 90 percent of all of the dental Mac users that they purchased when they purchased dental Mac, that 85 to 90 percent of them were on another software program, any program except Soft Dental Practice Works. What do you mean? Because except Soft Dental Practice Works. Because they resented Kodak <laughs> for having for having abused them and not supporting and continuing to develop dental Mac on a Mac. So Kodak was like the last company they were going to buy software from. And what Kodak was trying to do, they were going like, oh, well, you know, I'll, we'll buy the users. Uh, we'll give them a product that runs on Windows. We won't, we won't update Dental Mac, so they'll need to go there. Well, they did everything they could to avoid doing that. And, turn, and, and if they bought a PC product, it was some product other than theirs. Many of them stayed on Mac. Uh, and so those clients became, the majority of those clients became Mac, Mac practice clients, almost 98%. 99%, maybe even more than 99%, became my practice clients. And that's kind of the core because what we did is we fulfilled the promise of other, co other companies made that did not deliver to the Mac users. And, and so we have a very loyal following of people that want to have a Mac solution. And they what, what do you think your current users, 1,500 users, like most about um, using Dental Mac? Do you think a lot, what percent of uh, it Mac practice. Because, Mac practice. Yeah. What, what percent of it is because they just like Mac and they like Apple? Well, it's that same user-friendly feeling. So it's a very interesting thing. And the, there, there are enough people that love a Mac that they will compromise, that there's a potential that they would compromise and have an inferior product because it's on a Mac. But my goal from the very beginning, although I was aware of that, is that that would never be the premise of Mac practice. Mac practice's objective has always been to have – uh, we love the fact that a client wants to be on a Mac and that we're taking advantage of Apple technology and that they appreciate and understand the benefit, the low cost of, uh, low total cost of ownership, uh, the fact that it's up all the time, uh, all the things that our users say now about the product. You said low cost of total ownership. Yes. Because a Mac is more expensive, but you say um, total cost because you think they're more expensive but they last longer? Is that your, well, what you mean by total cost? Well, it's absolutely true that they last longer. But in addition to that, the lower cost of support. So there have been studies that have shown that a Mac requires 10% of the support of a PC. An example is some of and your... Explain to my homies what you mean by support. You mean IT support? I'm talking about on-site IT support. Installing antiviral software. Which, uh, which almost none of my users actually do, install antiviral software. And, and they why, also, and it, you know, the antiviral software doesn't work, so they also don't pay IT people to come and fix it, even though, you know, to take care of the fact that they connected the internet so immediately. So explain, explain to dentists who do root canals, why, why does Mac not get viruses? Okay, so it, um, it's... There are a number of theories as to why Mac does not get viruses. So here's one theory. One theory is that there aren't enough users. That I don't know, at this point, there's 30 to 40 million users on a Macintosh. But for some reason, that's not interesting enough to people that develop viruses. So that's one theory. Another theory is that OS X is more secure. That's, and every version gets more secure. So that's, an, that's another theory. I just know that it's true that if you were to look, go on the internet and look at viruses and how they affect Mac versus PCs, so it's you clear. say thirty to forty million use Mac. I think it's thirty to forty million. This time, and how many would use, use Microsoft? Oh, it's um, hundreds of millions. I don't know, you yeah. know. And that that does maybe make a sense. billions. And that does seem logical because you've seen in a lottery, like when someone has a chance to win a million dollars, nobody plays, even though a million dollars would be a total game changer right. in the average life American. And then when it gets to ten million, no one plays. But as soon as it gets to a hundred million, 
then the cells go crazy. Right. Which I always think is funny because as if a million or 10 million wouldn't change grandma's life, <laughs> but she's not interested until it's a right. hundred million. Right, right. And then at a hundred million, she's, she's, you know, right. running to the Seven Eleven. And, and And that could be true, but all of those are theoretical and doesn't really matter. The bottom line is that our users are up more often. Uh, I had a, uh, one of my representatives in uh, in the Pennsylvania area told me that he had some clients that were asking him about, you know, could you do a contract for me? Very common in PCs. In, P- in the PC world, people have, uh, you know, have uh, their IT people on a retainer and they pay them a monthly fee whether they need them or not because, unfortunately, they need them enough to have them on a monthly, ret- on a monthly retainer. Uh, and he was actually investigating and going through all his numbers and examining his several hundred clients and looking at how much they paid him over, the le- over several years. And he said, on average, they're only paying me four to $500. It's not worth it for them to pay me on retainer. I'd be taking advantage of them. So there are years in which they pay nothing. Um, I don't know if you know uh, John Ferens, uh, a very well-known prosthodontist here in Manhattan, has uh, maybe 20 Macs, I don't know how many iPads, maybe you know, 10 or 12 iPads. He's on a video on Mac, on Mac practice, and uh, he has a very, very high-end system. And he was asked this question on the video, and he, they said, uh, he said, well, how much do you spend per year for, for on-site support? And he said, well, I have to think about it. Um, I don't think there's been a year in which I've spent even $1,000 on, on on-site IT support. And I think that you would find that the people, that PC users, the primary, you know, I hear very high numbers, nothing com- comparable to that. So it's not only the cost of the IT, IT support, but that's enough in terms of total cost of ownership. If you were willing to, if you paid 10% more for something at the beginning, and I'm not going to tell you that it would be 10% more. My practice software would not be 10% more. The training's not 10% more. Um, but perhaps the computers might be more, but they're better. Macs are better, you know. I'm, I'm going to keep going with that. Um, and but it's what you pay afterwards yeah. that is the but total cost of ownership. Are we? How close are we getting to the cloud where um, this won't be doing any computing anyway, and it'll all be on the cloud? How? Well, I so I know this is going to go contrary, perhaps, to what you think. But when I have people call me about the cloud, I don't have people that are on a Mac system that call me about the cloud. I generally, the people that are calling me are almost all of them trying to get rid of their PC server that's in their office. They have problems with their PC server. It doesn't have a, uh, it doesn't have a client operating system that they can understand, so they have no choice except to call their IT person. So they have a lot of expense. They have a lot of downtime. They have a lot of problems. What they're really trying to get rid of is they're not really trying to put what they have in the cloud. What they're really trying to do is trying to get rid of that PC server and everything that's associated with it. So I tell them I know, and I ask them these questions. I say, well, let me ask you, you know, do you, do you, you know, do you happen to have a PC server? And they say, yes. And you have problems with it from time to time. And they say, yes. <laughs> so they give me all these things that they're, you know, and, and, and I say, well, you know, you called me because you called me because you thought that you could have something that was more reliable because you have a Mac at home and you know that you don't have problems and you'd like to have that same reliability in your office. So you ask, so I'm, ans- I'm telling you that you can have that greater reliability in your office. And you're asking me this question because you're kind of like on automatic asking me about the cloud because you want to get rid of the PC server. But when you called me, my software doesn't run on a PC server. My software runs on a Mac, just like the one that you have in your home that's very reliable that you already want. So I think for the largest, the largest number of dentists, I don't think they want to have their patient records in the cloud. I don't think they want to be subject today to whether or not they can work depending upon whether Time Warner works or whether their ISP works or whether they got a strong internet connection. I don't think they want their staff to be slow because there's some kind of a break. I don't think they want to change one IT support. First of all, you still have to use a, a computer. So you still have IT support. The only computer you got rid of was that server. You still have to have a terminal. Plus, then you've got this issue about the fact that everything's going to be somewhat slower. Everything's got to be protected because you've got to, you know, because you're, everything's, even if, even if you're an office not connected to a remote office, but you're in that office, you're still needing to protect everything because you, the only way for you to access everything is by connecting remotely. Then you got, I, I, if I told you, this is the most amazing thing to me. If I told you that I was going to take your, I was going to physically take your server personally, and I was going to give it to my friend, but I wasn't going to give you my friend's name, his number, where he lived, or even what country he was in. 
would, and it has all your patient records, and you don't even know if you'll ever get your patient records again unless you pay me every month for the rest of your, the time that you're in practice. And then you have to pay me for seven years after that so you can continue to have access. Would you even consider it? But that's what the cloud is. The cloud is, does anybody, that any doctor that's using a cloud solution, do they know who the hosting company is? No, they don't know who the hosting company is. And then they say, oh, well, it's great. It's like at the hosting company, and then it's also copied someplace else. Do we know if that's in Iran? Is it in Iraq? Is it in Russia? Is, <laughs> is it in China? Well, the thing about hosting is... Um it looks like Amazon.com is walking away with the, the cloud storage. And I, I was noticing on their earnings last year that uh, half of their revenue came from uh, cloud storage. Right. And the, the cloud storage is growing so fast that before long, I mean, when they start off, I thought of them as the company sold books. And then they right. added shoes and, right. and appliances. And, and now it's like they're turning into a cloud storage company. Why, why did Amazon walk away with that and not Google or well, IBM? Or? It is very interesting. Well, number one, they have a low, in price, low pricing model, and they may be actually buying the market. Uh, you're aware of the fact, because I know you, you write, you're aware of the fact that Amazon, now that they basically – they could, you could say virtually own the publishing market, that they are in the business of telling people whether or not they'll publish a book. Mm -hmm. Do we actually want that? I mean, that's basically what we're talking about. We're talking about a company that distributed things below cost to drive everybody out of business, to drive your local big bookstore out of business so you can't go look at a book. You have to buy it through Amazon because, or you have to drive like 50 miles in order to go to a Barnes and Noble because of the fact that it's out of business. They closed that operation because Amazon drove them out because they were willing to sell a book for less than cost. The book might be at the cost, but they're going to ship it to you for nothing. Now they want to start charging shipping. What are they going to do in the cloud if they drive everybody out of business? The fee that they're, you're paying now is going to increase. They're basically doing, that's their model. Their model is to buy the market at whatever they possibly can, even if they have to lose money to do it. And then they'll determine what's best, and they'll charge whatever they want. And what are you going to do? Where's your patient information? So if you're, you're talking to thousands of dentists out there, if, if um, some dentist, I, I, see, I see this a lot. They, they went through dental school on a Mac. Mm -hmm. um, is that the proper thing to call it, a Mac? Is yeah, what you call it? Uh, sure. Uh, they went through dental school on a Mac. Uh, they're now working for old man McGregor, and uh, he's on, uh, like I say, I just never see him happy on Dentrix, Eagle Soft. I've used Soft Dent for 20 years. I've noticed that every dentist that ever worked for me in 20 years left, not one of them said, oh, yeah, I'm going to use that Soft Dent that old Howie had. Not one of them. They all hate it. And um, so why, why, So tell them what's, the, what's their pitch. Why, why should they go with you? Well, I, we've been in the business for 30 years. We're a profitable company from the first day that we opened Mac Practice 12 years ago. Um, we have uh, enough users to be able to support our development. We have a th 135 employees in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, we're dedicated to the and development of software. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, of those 135 employees, how many of them are big red pants? <laughs> 100 percent of them are oh big my red God. pants. I went to Creighton. <laughs> I've never seen a state endorsed their college football team more than Nebraska. <laughs> I don't think there's a state that endorses their professional NFL team right. as much as Nebraska. That, those are the craziest, hardest core fans. Well, we're in the Haymarket District. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so we have to be very, very careful. On, when we come I, in on I Saturday, Sunday, it might be hard to I, get in our office. <laughs> yeah, I, I love Lincoln. It is a yeah. beautiful town. So, so you're in Lincoln. We're in Lincoln. We have 30,000 square feet. We've got a commitment to the market. We have 40. We, I believe personally, in my experience over 30 years, that the best kind of training is on site. Somebody who can actually see what's happening in your office, help your staff understand how they're going to do with Mac practice, what they did with Dentrix or EagleSoft or practice works previously, and actually get them up and running, hands on, seeing what the practice actually does. And so we have 40 regional people that actually are full time people that work and go into clients' offices and do training and installation. Uh, they do sales, and then they do, they're available for ongoing training uh, and ongoing consulting as needed. So who's your, who's your star practice management consultant? My star – you, you know, you, we've firm. had this conversation a couple – a year ago. We yeah. were talking about the um, – that you were not – you're not satisfied with the kind of reporting that's available, that you would like to see different reports. And Well, I, I, I think it's crazy that no – Practice management software is connected up to accounting software. Right. So, and we talked about this earlier today yeah, a little bit, yeah. yeah. But but who, who's your star consultant? I mean, do you, do you have one 
Do you, we, do you we, have a we, lead star consultant? We, we don't have one. Uh, but, but you have some good ones? Well, we, we have. We, I think what happened, what's happened so far with us is that our clients have bought Mac Practice. I guess I'm the star consultant, but I don't purport myself to be a consultant to my clients. Because you start off in dental office consulting. That's correct. And, and, and how many, that was 30 years ago. That's 30 years ago, right. Yeah. So I do my... I'm involved in the actual development design of the application. Yeah. And so I do input, but I listen to other people. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, because I'm, I'm trying to think of a kill two birds with one stone. I, I think what might be good for you is to uh, create an online uh, CE course on, on practice management consultation. How, you know, cause every dentist wants to have a busier office with less stress and that's more money. I mean, they all want, they all want to run more efficiently, um, see less patients for more money, for more net income, lower overhead, whatever. And if you, sh- and if you um, showed them what you picked up on practice management over 30 years, whether that took an hour or two hours, but explaining it while you were demoing your, uh, your uh, Macintosh uh, Apple software, um, that might, uh, you might teach everybody how to be better practice management and then sell some software on the side. I think, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I think it'd be great. I think that's a great idea. The other thing I've talked about doing is working with consultants, um, and and I've worked with uh, Sally McKenzie a little bit to look at the kind of information that she likes her likes her offices to have and her consulting team. And I like to work with other consultants to see if we can tweak and we can work to make to do the best we can to be able to provide what other consultants think. They, consultants don't necessarily emphasize the same thing, and they have different ideas as to what's important. Uh, but there's no reason that we can't work with our product. One of the things that we've done, Howard, I don't know if um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we are uh, EagleSoft and um, and Dentrix uh, and PracticeWorks. None of them have invested their money in making their product uh, government certified for electronic health records. And it's not really important to to all dentists, but it's important to about 14% of dentists, and it's important to Americans because we spent. I don't know how many billions of dollars. It's probably close to thirty billion dollars that we 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 provided to put in providers' practices, including dentists who are uh, who see Medicaid patients uh, and Medicare patients. Medicare obviously doesn't affect many dentists. Primarily, uh, it would be primarily it would be uh, oral surgery. But as governments, you know, as consumers, this is this is uh, treating the underserved when we talk about Medic- uh, Medicaid for dentistry. And we've invested in doing that. So our product is government certified. Our product meets, that means that we are, our product is more secure than a software that's not certified. That means that our secure messaging is built into our application. It's not an add-on. It's not something that's outside the product. It's built into the application because it's required by the certification in order to do that. Um, and it means that our customers that choose to see patients, the underserved patients, are able to actually use the software, demonstrate meaningful use, and receive incentives of as much as $63,750 per provider in their practice from the government. So we, think that's a, we don't think that that group of, of clients, of dentists, should be ignored. Particularly in, de, in, in pediatric dentistry, that's about 70 to 80% of pediatric dentists see Medicaid patients. Well, Obamacare mandated that when you sell health insurance, that children under 18 should have a dental provision. Right. And that's um, covered so many children now that now there's no way these children can be seen. And California State Assembly is the first state to be having lots of meetings on this. And that they're already deciding that they're going to have to double uh, the fees paid on the Medicaid state California plan for for children because... The, the fees were so low. There were so few providers. The dentist wouldn't the, see around. The unmet was is just monstrosity. So, yeah. so there are a lot more general dentists that are seeing children, and Absolutely. this is another issue. So I'm seeing children. Hey, why shouldn't I get sixty three thousand seven hundred fifty dollars? I'm you know if I I and it, it's by I, I want to emphasize is by provider. In other words, you could have several providers in the practice. Maybe just one of the providers sees the Medicaid patients, and if thirty percent of their encounters in a ninety day period are Medicaid, just thirty percent for that provider, you get sixty three thousand seven hundred fifty. If so all is, Sally, doing, is Sally McKenzie, is she a big fan of your software? I, I don't, well, I buy, you know, Sally McKenzie is also a publisher. Mm-hmm. You know, she does the new, uh, it's a, I think it's the new dentist is her publication. Mm-hmm. So I meet with her and I talk about the new dentist. I think she's a fan. I mean, she's very yeah. enthusiastic when we talk about my practice and we talk about the government incentives and we talk about what we've done. Um, she's, she's excited about it. I don't want to 
paint her as, you know, I, I, I know her in that context. I, I remember going to her birthday party in San Diego. That was one of the, <laughs> that was one of the most fun parties I've ever been to. She's a, she's a fun person. <laughs> she is. She's, she she's is. got a great personality. Yeah, she's a, a dynamo. But, uh, well, hey, uh, any, anything else you want to say to the... the- um, I, I just, we're, uh, we're a company that t- stays up to date with technology. So Apple has been changing its operating system every year now for several years. I don't know if you know that. Mm-hmm. And it's not inconsequential that you have to make your product work in the most recent environment. We're also a company that is the leading developer, as I said, both medical and dental. So I noticed, I mean, there's some incredible number of courses of, uh, on sleep apnea. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's great. You're going to treat sleep apnea. How are you going to bill for it? It's a medical procedure. Right. How are you going to meet bell for it? Your software can't do that, particularly since ICD-10. It was, would have been complicated enough with ICD-9, diagnostics codes, prior to October 1, but our software has ICD-10 built in so that actually it assists you in coding, and we're already using it with thousands of providers throughout the United States because all of the chiropractors and physicians used it, and it's right in Mac Practice DDS. There's no additional cost, and it allows them to save that, keep that 10% that they might be giving a billing service for doing the sleep apnea services. So what if someone wants to talk to you? Do you recommend email, phone? How, how does someone contact you? Well, what, what is your website? I'm very, it's macpractice.com. Macpractice, M-A-C, yeah. practice.com. Macpractice.com. It's very easy. The name of our product is Macpractice DDS. The name of our, of our website is Macpractice.com. The name of our company is Macpractice. And My practice or Mac? Mac, Mac practice. So I'm the sorry. name of the company is Macpractice. The right. name of the software is Macpractice. Right. But the website- and the name of the website is Macpractice.com. Okay. I'm sorry if I said it incorrectly. No, what would you say Mac Practice DDS? Mac Practice DDS is the name of the software. So our dental software is oh, Mac so. Practice DDS. Okay. And so and if they what's a veterinarian? DVM? We don't have a, a veterinarian software oh, okay. right now. So the medical is Mac Practice MD, the chiropractic is Mac Practice D C and the the uh, eye care is Mac Practice twenty twenty. Right on. So um, go to MacPractice.com. Go to the main page because it's a great way. When you work, when you're developing, you know, purchasing a software program, you are entering into a relationship with the developer. You need to know who the developer is. You need to know what their capabilities are. Are they going to still be around? Are they committed? Do they have the resources to deliver on promises they make to you? Are they going to do continually innovate? And so take a look at my practice, evaluate as a company, and then go to my practice DDS, the homepage for that, and look at all the things that we've done. We're developing specialty pages, uh, some of which are already there, so you can see things that are just particular for pediatric dentistry or general dentistry or oral surgery or endodontics. So all that information is already there. Uh, register there and take a look at the QuickTime movies of our application at your own leisure at whatever time you want to. And when you get an email, I'll actually be the one that actually looks at your registration and I will, re- I will copy your local representative. That's, that's a full-time person that just works with Mac Practice clients and Mac Practice products that's in your region. And that person will then be available to you to provide you with uh, 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 referrals uh, to answer questions that you might have, to give you an on-site or remote demo of what you may not have seen in the videos. So it's a very you know easy way to be able to learn about uh, about the software. And if you already will have my contact information if you registered at the website, so you'll be able to you know to correspond directly with me if you want to and ask any questions. That's it. Sounds great, Ryan. Do you have any questions? I know, uh, I know he's, uh, my son's uh, behind the podcaster right. and he's uh, 22 and I believe all my sons are on Mac. Uh, no, half of them. The half that, like, who's on, who's on Mac? Me and Zach. You and Zach, the two <laughs> youngest, the 20, 22 year old Mac. And, um, um, he's been telling me for, uh, his own life to, uh, give up the two skis and get a snowboard <laughs> and, uh, throw in my stupid Dell and get a Mac. Maybe one of these days, Ryan, I'll surprise you and you'll teach you an old dog new tricks. Did, but, hey, did you know, Howard, that you can run windows on a Mac? No, I did not. So why oh, you can run windows on a Mac? Yeah. I know. I know you can buy a Mac that runs windows. You can buy any Mac that you buy can run windows. Any Mac that you buy. If you go to Serona's booth. They're running Windows on a Mac. They're using Macs. Why are they using Macs? Because the Mac is better. Other than be running Windows on a Windows machine, correct? If you go to Plan Mecca, they're running Windows on a Mac. They, now, they also have Mac native software be- Because well. the, the Mac computer is just more like a Mercedes-Benz. The, it's, yes, it's like getting a Mercedes-Benz for less than 10% more <laughs> 
than getting a Volkswagen. Yeah. So, I mean, your, their difference is so small. Well, I have to admit, I, I uh, switched from my uh, Motorola cell phone, uh, my Motorola flip phone, <laughs> To an iPhone, and that was a game changer. I mean, yeah. one, once once I went to an iPhone, I mean, I can never go back to a Motorola or a Nokia. And you now have yeah. a you now have a customer experience of Apple. You understand, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I, I get. It. So, did you see the movie? Oh yeah, I saw the movie. Hey, Actually, the, I sent the, all my employees to the movie. <laughs> the, 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 the new one? When, what was the new one called? Fastbender. Oh, uh, Steve Jobs. Fastbender. Fastbender is the uh, Michael Fastbender, I believe, was the actor. That played Steve and Jobs. So, so was the movie, it was good to see? What did you think of the movie? Well, it, you know, it was kind of interesting because I was at, I, I've been at every keynote that Apple gave uh, at every Mac World uh, since, I, I don't know, I guess for, for 30 years, they stopped going to Mac Worlds a few years, you know, a number of years ago, maybe about five years ago. And so I was at that Mac World where, you know, where he does the presentation and he chews out Steve Wozniak. I've met Steve Wozniak. Uh, Patrick has met uh, Steve Jobs. A, a, a funny story is Patrick, Steve Jobs said, can I demo Dental Mac? I want to demo your software. And, and uh, Patrick looked at him and said, I don't think you want to demo my software. Let me demo the software. And Steve looked at him and said, I understand. Because <laughs> it was like beta software. Yeah. So he didn't want it to, he didn't want it to, you know, you saw that whole scene. In, did you see the movie? No, not yet. Oh, okay. In, in the movie, he blows up because of the fact that, uh, that, that the software did not work the way he wanted it to. And so that's what that's what Patrick did not want so to have he was, happen. He was kind of a crazy guy, wasn't he? Or he, would, what, how would you describe him? Intense. Uh, uh, he was intense. He was a perfectionist. Uh, he had some weird traits, uh, personal traits. What uh, were his weird personal traits? Well, there are stories about the fact that he smelled. Yeah. You know that he was that he was not hygienic. Right. Um, you know he he had a very interesting. You know he was he was adopted. He was not. You know so. There's a whole psychological thing of maybe feeling unwanted. Separation anxiety. Yes. Uh, he, knew his, he knew his father. His father lived in like La Jolla, I think, uh, real, in, like in a restaurant, father. his biological father. He found out who he was, and he, went, he would go to his restaurant. He was a vegetarian or a vegan. I don't know, remember which. But anyway, he would go to his restaurant and order. And one, in one of the scenes, he's in the restaurant, and they know that's his father, but his father doesn't know that he's Steve Jobs' father. But he's been going there for years and eating there at the restaurant. It's really kind of, you know, so the, he's, he's, uh, he is, I will say this, I will say that he definitely changed the world with his perfectionism. He was hard to live with. Uh, he was hard to work for, uh, but he demanded perfection. Uh, he didn't take no for an answer. Uh, and, um, you know, I can identify, I can identify uh, my partner. I believe I can identify as a, as an entrepreneur. I don't think I'm not saying that in any way I'm Steve Jobs by any means whatsoever. But I think some of the personality traits of somebody who's driving to have the best product that they possibly can, um, somebody who thinks that they have you know certain gifts and talents for creating a product that suits many customers and and understanding that I think and somebody listening to people and incorporating their suggestions, which is what we do every day. I think I think there's you know I think that there are probably a lot of software developers who are entrepreneurs that are truly inspired to do what they do that that can identify with that. So I don't think I'm alone there. But uh, most, most psychiatrists will say it takes a little bit of crazy to lead to a lot of success. Yeah. I mean, if you're just a real normal, moderate, easygoing person, you're not going to round up a lot of troops and get them to tackle the hill. It usually takes some something else, a little of something. And whether that's a passionate vision, a little bit of craziness. I mean, um, one of my favorite books of all time was The Hypomanic Edge, how a little bit of crazy leads to a lot of success. Right. And uh, so, yeah. so does that mean you have a little bit of crazy heart? I think so. Ryan's my son. Ryan, my a little <laughs> bit crazy. What percent batshit crazy is your father? <laughs> What'd you say? I said a lot of bit crazy. A lot of batshit <laughs> crazy. All right. Well, hey, thank you for your time. Thanks, Howard. And uh, have fun at the Greater New York. Thanks. I hope we have an opportunity to do this again sometime. Absolutely. We will. Okay. Thank you.